hope all of you are doing good we continue our discussion of the emperor johns of uh, eugene o'neill in the previous uh, lectures we have seen the background the source and uh, the two initial scenes of the play the emperor johns today we have to commence the third scene of the play and before moving on to the uh, third scene let us just uh, review what happens in scene one a quick review of what happens in scene one and uh, two scene one uh, the very realistic scene of uh, the play we see the most significant characters smithers the lieutenant of emperor johns and uh, his uh, boss that is the hero of the play emperor johns in conversation and we understand the past of both the most uh, both the characters smithers as well as emperor johns in the first uh, scene and we understand that uh, the inhabitants of the island are just uh, in revolt and they are going to begin a battle against their boss their emperor the cruel brutus johns the emperor johns and uh, when smithers informs emperor johns that uh, his subjects all the inhabitants of the island are in revolt they have gone to the distant hill and they just uh, began their rituals the pagan rituals to get the blessings of the god to start the war against emperor johns emperor johns decides to go away from the island he knew that he as we understand he knew that uh, of course uh, the one day the inhabitants will revolt and uh, the uh, emperor job will come to an end and now that he is informed that the inhabitants of the island have uh, begun their protest their revolt they are just beating the tom tom and uh, uh, they will very soon hound him when he understands that he is declaring to his lieutenant smithers that he will run into the jungle and he will cross the jungle go to the other side of the forest and board the french gunboat which is waiting for him he has invested a lot of money in the banks in europe that is uh, to be very precise in france and uh, he will be leading a very luxurious life in france this is it this is what happened in scene number uh, one and when we move on to scene two uh, it is scene one the time is the afternoon it is afternoon three o'clock and scene two it is night four it is seven seven fifteen seven thirty and john's is uh, at the border of uh, the forest he's on the edge of the forest he is just uh, planning to cross the jungle and he's very tired he has been walking he uh, searches for the food he buried in the forest and he cannot find uh, any of the food he buried there and he becomes very very uh, tensed and worried and uh, very soon he sees the little formless spheres and and we know that the little formless spheres are the very incarnations of the uh, the fears deep inside the collective unconscious of emperor jones and he is so worried at the sight of the formless little formless spheres and he fires at them and they vanish and he lost his first bullet as we know uh, the emperor job uh, he began 
Emperor Jones began his emperor job with the story of the silver bullet. And now he has a pistol with him. There are six bullets in the pistol. And the sixth one is the silver bullet. Of all the six bullets, he has lost the first bullet in scene one. And now we move on to the third scene. I will read out the third scene and uh, we will have a discussion. So before reading out the third scene, I'll give you a gist of what happened in third scene. In the third scene, uh, it is the great forest. It is of course uh, the entire action. The location is the great forest. And John's, Emperor John sees Jeff, the Negro, he had killed for cheating at dice in uh, United States of America. And he fires at Jeff and he uh, loses his second bullet. And that is uh, the uh, in, in incident in this. This is the most important incident in scene three. The time is uh, nine uh, in the evening. And uh, after uh, the firing, the uh, scene of Jeff is just disappearing. That's what happened in scene number three. Let us just read and understand the very coarse uh, text. So scene three, it's nine o'clock in the forest. The moon was just risen. It, its beams are drifting through the canopy of leaves make a barely perceptible suffused eerie glow. A dense low wall of underbrush and creepers is in the nearer foreground, fencing in a small triangular clearing. Beyond this is the massed blackness of the forest like an encompassing barrier. A path is dimly discerned leading down to the clearing from left rear and winding away from it again toward the right. As the scene opens, nothing can be distinctly made out except for the beating of the tom-tom, which is a trifle louder and quicker than in the previous scene. There is silence broken every few seconds by a pure clicking sound. Then gradually the figure of the Negro Jeff can be discerned crouching on his haunches at the rear of the triangle. He is middle-aged, thin, brown in color, is dressed in a Pullman Porter's uniform. So uh, we have uh, the forest scene, scene three, Emperor John's in the forest. He sees his colleague, Pullman Porter, Jeff, in the uniform of the Pullman Porter. He's throwing a pair of dice on the ground before him, picking them up, shaking them, casting them one uh, by one out with the regular rigid mechanical movements of an automation. So the game of uh, uh, dice is going on and uh, we have uh, 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 Jeff, and John's, John's thinks that uh, he is just uh, uh, seeing the ghost of uh, Jeff. John's thinks that he, he sees the uh, ghost of John's and he is very, very afraid. And now uh, he is throwing a pair of dice on uh, the ground before him, picking them up, shaking them casting them out with the regular rigid mechanical movements of an automation. The heavy plodding footsteps of someone approaching along the trail from the left are heard and John's voice pitched in a slightly higher key and strained in a cheering effort to overcome its own tremors. So we have right now, Emperor John's very, very afraid of the ghost of uh, Jeff, his colleague, the Pullman Porter. And we also hear the sound of somebody coming closer. So this is the very technique of Eugene O'Neill. Uh, he used, this is of course a wonderful expressionistic play. And uh, uh, he uses, uh, of course, uh, 
very effectively uh, sound and uh, uh, sound and light. So with the help of light and sound, the expressionistic uh, effect is being uh, ensured by Eugene O'Neill. So now let's see the very dialogue of uh, scene number three, the moon's rise risen. Does you hear that nigger? You get small light from this out. No more butting ye full head, aging the trunks and scratching the hide of you. Hide of your legs in the bushes. Now you cease where you're going. So cheer up. From now on, you have a snap. Okay, so John speaks to himself. He tells himself that the moon has risen and uh, he is asking himself if he can hear the noise. Uh, that is, of course, the noise of somebody coming closer. And uh, he asks himself to cheer up. He steps just to the rear of the triangular clearing and mops off his face on his sleeve. He has lost his Panama hat. So he has been running uh, and uh, now he lost his uh, Panama hat and he is just uh, uh, very tired and uh, uh, sweat, drops of sweat is dripping down. He has lost his Panama hat. His face is scratched. His brilliant uniform shows several large rents. So from this, we understand that he was just uh, running far and wide in the forest. So his uniform is uh, having large rents there and here. What time is it getting to be? I wonder. So he asked himself, what time it is? Uh, getting to be i uh, wonder i does in light no match to find out foo it was warm and that's a fuck so here he asked himself what time it is going to be i wonder i will not light a match to find out foo so uh, he doesn't want to light any more matches because if he's lighting matches people will uh, find him so uh, uh, how I, I does in light no match to find out. Uh, he says, I don't, I don't light any more matches. Uh, must be hours. Uh, how long I have been making tracks in these woods? How long have I been uh, running here? How long have I been walking in this forest? Must be hours and hours. I might have walked hours and hours. Seems like forever. It can't be when the moon's there just risk. This am um, a long night for your your majesty with a mournful chuckle. Majesty, there ain't much majesty about this baby now. So he speaks to himself that he is no more uh, the emperor. He is no more uh, a majesty with an attempted cheerfulness. Never mind. Never mind. It's all part of the game. This night come to and end like everything else so he talks to himself he consoles himself don't worry no matter uh, that uh, all this ember job is coming to an end maybe of course uh, uh, never mind it's all part of the game this is part of the game this night come to an end like everything else and when you get star safe and has that bang roll in your hands you love all uh, this Okay, so Embra Jones, we know, uh, has a lot of deposits in the foreign banks and he soon will uh, go to France. And when he reaches France and he gets all the money, he will enjoy. So, and when you get that safe and that, and has that bankroll in your hands, you laugh all at this. He starts to whistle, but checks himself abruptly. But you're whistling for your poor dog. Want all the world to heed you. He stops, talk to listen. Hear that old drum shore gets nearer from the sound. They are packing it along with them. Time for me to move. He takes a step forward and stops worriedly. That's that odor cure clickety sound I hear. There it is sound close sound like sound like for god's sake 
sound like some nigger was shooting crap frighteningly i better beat it quick when it when i gets them notions so uh, right now emperor jones is very upset and uh, he is uh, uh, so worried by the uh, noise of uh, the uh, 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 drum beats the tom tom sound is just uh, disturbing him and uh, and and he he is just uh, responding to uh, the very very noise of uh, the tom tom who there who that is that you jeff starting toward the other forgetful for a moment of his surroundings and really believing it is a living man that he sees in a tone of happy relief so now he sees uh, uh, the apparition or the image of somebody and he asks are is is that you jeff is that you jeff he is asking uh, jeff are you jeff uh, staring toward the other jeff i see show mighty glad to see you they told me you done died from that race that i give you stopping suddenly bewilderedly but how you come to be here nigger he stares fascinatedly at the other who continues his mechanical play with the dice john's eyes begin to roll wildly he stutters i and you going look up can you speak to me okay now ebra john sees the image of uh, um uh, uh, jeff jeff is playing the dice and he speaks to jeff uh, can you hear me uh, why are you here is you is you a uh, a have went he jerks out his revolver in a frenzy of terrified rage nigger i kills you dead once as i got to kill you again you take it then he fires now he sees jeff and he is afraid of uh, uh, the ghost of um, jeff and uh, now that uh, he cannot control any more he fires at jeff as i got to kill you again you take it then he fires when he small when the smoke clears away jeff has disappeared john stands trembling then with a certain reassurance is gone anyway having or no having that shot fixed him so now jones has fired at uh, jeff and uh, uh, the the image of jeff has the uh, the apparition or the ghost uh, just vanishes and now uh jones is rather calm and quiet is gone is gone anyway having or no having that shot fix him the beat of the far of tom tom is perceptibly louder and more rapid jones becomes conscious of it with a start looking back over his shoulder they getting near they is coming fast and your eye is shooting shots to let them know just where i is oh gory i's got to run so now ebra jones is very very worried because he is very soon reminded of the fact that now that he has fired at uh, the ghost of jeff the sound should have gone out and the natives might have heard the sound and they would come near and they will know the location of embra john so he is asking himself to be very very uh, vigilant and alert oh gory oh gory i i have to run now i have to run otherwise i may be uh, captured by the inhabitants forgetting the path he plunges wildly into the underbrush in the rear and disappears in the shadow so with that we come to the end of scene 3 and we move on to scene 4 so let us review once again uh, the palace uh, scene 1 was afternoon 3 o'clock palace of emperor johns then scene 2 nightfall uh, 7 pm 
and that was of course in the forest uh, meeting uh, of uh, John's and the little formless fears. He fires at uh, the little formless fears. He lost his fir first bullet and now seen three, nine a.m. Uh, in the forest, Emperor John sees uh, his colleague in United States of America, the Pullman Porter Jeff, Jeff playing dice and uh, uh, he fires at the ghost of Jeff and he lost his second bullet. Now we move on to scene four. And scene four, the time is 11 p.m. That is almost, uh, yeah, two hours past. It is 11 p.m. So let us just read and understand scene three of the play by Eugene O'Neill, Emperor Johns. Scene, uh, scene uh, no, no, not scene three, scene four. Scene 11 o'clock in the forest, a wide dirt road runs diagonally from right front to left rear, rising sheer on both sides, the forest walls it in. The moon is now up. Under its light, the rod gleams, gleamers ghastly and unreal. It's as if the forest had stood aside momentarily to let the rod pass through and accomplish its Veil purpose. This done, the forest will fall in upon itself again and the road will be no more. John stumbles in from the forest on the right. His uniform is ragged and torn. He looks about him with numb surprise when he sees the rod, his eyes blinking in, in the bright moonlight. He flops down exhaustedly and pants heavily for a while then with sudden anger. So right now, uh, John is in the forest. He is very, very tired and worn out. He's just uh, falling down exhaustedly uh, and he's breathing heavily for a while and he's very, very angry. And now we have the dialogue of uh, Emperor John. I am melting with heat, running and running and running. Damn this here, this this hair caught like a straight jacket. It tears off his coat and flings it away from him, revealing himself stripped to the waist. So now he's very tired and it's very hot, and he just tears apart his uh, dress, his coat, and uh, there, that's better. Now I can breathe. Now that he has removed his shirt, he is of course feeling more comfortable. He has, uh, uh, it's more cool. And uh, he says, now I can, I, can, I can breathe. Looking down at his feet, the spurs catch his eye. And to hell with these high fangled spurs, they are what has been tripping me up and breaking my neck. Now he looks down and he just uh, sees the, uh, uh, the, the spurs and he says that uh, he has been uh, disturbed by the spurs and he unstraps them and flings them away disgustedly. So he's just uh, uh, loosening the spurs and he's just throwing away there. I get rid of them, free petty emperor trappings as I travels lighter. Lord, I am tired. And he speaks to himself that he is very tired. After a pause, listening to the insistent beat of the tom tom in the distance, I must have put some distance between myself and them running like that. And yet, that damn drum sound just the same nearer even. So now, uh, in the distance, we can hear the Tom Tom sound, that is the sound of the inhabitants of the island, the native people coming closer. And he speaks to himself that now that I have run uh, for a while, I may be away from them. Well, I guess I almost holds my lead anyhow. He thinks that he is uh, having a lead. Uh, that's what he tells. I guess I almost holds my lead anyhow. They won't never catch up with a sigh. If only my full leg stands up. Oh, I am sorry. I have uh, went in for this. That Emperor job is sure hard to shake. 
He looks around him suspiciously. How is this rod ever get here? Good level rod too. So now he talks to himself that he's fed up with this emperor job and he's just wondering why and how he's, uh, he has come to the uh, rod. He's standing in the rod and he's asking to himself, how have I come to this rod? I never remember seeing it before. He talks to himself that he has never seen the rod. Shaking his head apprehensively, this woods is sure full of the curious things at night. With a sudden terror, Lord, God, don't let me see no more of them horns. They get my God. Then trying to talk himself into confidence. Horns, you fool nigger. They ain't no such things. Don't be the Baptist person tell you that many times. Is you civilized or is you like this ignorant black uh, niggers here? So you see, he is of course afraid of uh, the ghosts and uh, is assuring himself that uh, he is a member of the Baptist church and uh, there aren't any ghosts like that. He talks to himself. Show that was all in your own head. Was it nothing there? Was it no Jeff? No what? You just get seeing them things because your belly is empty and you sick with hunger inside. So now he thinks that he sees some ghosts in front of him and uh, he's just wondering why he sees the ghosts and he talks to himself that he sees ghosts because he is hungry. Hunger feeds your head and your eyes. Any fool know that. Then pleading fervently, but bless God, I don't come across no more of them. Whatever they is, then cautiously rest. Don't talk, rest. You need it. Then you get on your way again, looking at the moon. Nights half gone almost. You hit the coast in the morning. Then you are all safe. Okay, so now that Ebra Jones has been talking to himself, he uh, thinks that it is because of too much talking that he is very tired and he asks himself not to talk much. And he reassures himself that if he can be strong and uh, if he can cross the jungle by morning, he will reach the other side of uh, the forest and uh, uh, he can uh, save himself by boarding the French gunboat. Now we have the description from the right forward a small gang of Negroes enter. They are dressed in, so this is again uh, a, an apparition. So we have an apparition. So uh, we see a number of ghosts, like uh, John's thinks that uh, a number of uh, uh, Negroes uh, are in front of him. So from the right forward, a small gang of Negroes enter. They are dressed in strict convict suits. Their heads are shaven. One leg drags limpingly, shackled to a heavy ball and chain. Some carry picks, the others showers. So this is in fact the very past of Emperor Jones. Emperor Jones, after the murder of his colleague, Pullman Porter Jeff was imprisoned and he along with other convicts in the prison of the United States of America was taken uh, out for work and now he uh, remembers those days he had to uh, work hard in the prison. So some carry picks, others showers. They are followed by a white man dressed in the uniform of a prison guard. In the past, of course, uh, in previous uh, scenes, especially in uh, scene one, we had uh, the conversation between uh, Smithers and Embra Jones and Smithers was just mentioning about the uh, guard, the prison guard um, Jones killed. So we see the very ghost of or rather the very apparition of uh, the prison guard also in this scene that is scene number four. So from, um, uh, yeah, they are followed by a white man dressed in the uniform of a prison guard. A Winchester rifle is slung across his shoulders and he carries 
a heavy whip. At a signal from the guard, they stop on the road opposite where Johns is sitting. Johns, who, who has been staring up at the sky, unmindful of their noiseless approach, suddenly looks down and sees them. His eyes pop out. He tries to get to his feet and fly, but sinks back too numb by fright to move. His voice catches in a choking prayer. Lord Jesus. So now, uh, having seen the other prisoners and the prison guard, John is shocked and he cries, Lord Jesus. The prison guard cracks his whip. So on stage, we can see the slaves, the Negroes, and the prison guard. The prison guard is whipping, he is whipping the slaves and uh, uh, John's cannot bear his friends, his fellow prisoners, Negroes being beaten by the prison guard. They swing their picks, they shovel, uh, but not a sound comes from their labor. Their movements, like those of Jeff in the preceding scene, are those of automatons, rigid, slow, and mechanical. The prison guard points sternly at John's with his whip, motions him to take his place among the other shovelers. John's get to his feet in a hypnotized stupor. He mumbles subserviently, yes, sure, yes, sure, ice coming. So now when the prison guard is signaling to Emperor John's, he res responds and he talks that he will join the group of uh, the slaves who are working. Yes, I am I is coming. As he shuffles, dragging one foot over to his place, he curses under his breath with rage and hatred. Go damn you, Saul. I guess even with you sometime. Okay, go damn you, Saul. I'll have my revenge on you sometime. He speaks to the prison guard that he will take revenge on the prison guard sometime. Now we have a, a stage direction. As if there were a shovel in his hands, he goes through weary mechanical gestures of digging up dirt and throwing it to the roadside. Suddenly the guard approaches him angrily, threateningly, raises his whip and lashes John's viciously across the shoulders with it. John's winces with pain and Cowers abjectly, the guard turns his back on him and walks away contemptuously. Instantly, John straightens up with the arms upraised as if his shovel were a club in his hands. He springs murderously at the unsuspecting guard. In the act of crashing down his shovel on the white man's skull, John suddenly becomes aware that his hands are empty and he cries despairingly. So this is the very imagination of John's. John's thinks that he is standing near the prison guard and he thinks that he has the shovel with him and he wants to take revenge on the prison guard for beating, for whipping the Negroes. He lifts his shovel and he is about to hit at uh, the head of the prison guard, but suddenly he realizes the fact that he hasn't got any shovel uh, with him and he uh, utters in shock, wash my shovel, give me you, give me my, give me my shovel till I split this game head. So he's asking for his shovel, he wants to break the head of uh, the prison guard, appealing to his fellow convicts, give me a shovel, one of you, for God's sake. So he asked his fellow uh, prisoners to give him a shovel. They stand fixed in motionless attitudes, their eyes on the guard. The guard seems to wait expectantly, his back turned to the attacker. John bellows with baffled, terrified rage, tugging frantically at his revolver. Okay, now. Uh, John's, when he has no uh, shovel with him, he just uh, uh, picks, he takes his revolver. I kills you. 
you white devil, if it's the last thing I ever does, ghost or devil, I kill you again. Now he takes his revolver, he points the revolver to the prison guard, uh, a white American, and he tells, I kills you, you white devil. Look at that dialect of uh, John's. He says devil. Instead of devil, he says devil. If it's the last thing I have ever ever does, goes to devil, I kill you again. And now he fires at the prison guard and he loses his third bullet. Okay, so he fires the revolver and fires point blank at the guard's back. Instantly, the the way the walls of the forest close in from both sides. The road and the figures of the convict gang are blotted out in an enshrouding darkness. The only sounds are a crashing in the underbrush as John leaps away in mad flight and the throbbing of the tom-tom still far distant but increased in volume of sound and rapidity of beat. Okay, so we have come to the end of the fourth scene. And uh, let us just review scene one, realistic, the old native woman, Smithers, Emperor Johns. Johns is warned that the native people are going to revolt and uh, Emperor Johns, Brutus Johns decides to go away from the palace. He uh, tells himself that the emperor job, the time of the emperor job, emperor's job is up. Scene two, uh, he is in the forest, it's evening, he sees the little formless spheres and he thinks that the little formless spheres are ghosts and he fires at the little formless uh, fears and he lo loses his first uh, bullet. And scene three, okay, uh, again he is in the forest, he thinks that uh, uh, Jeff, his a companion, Pullman Porter, Jeff, his companion is playing dice and he is very, very upset and worried at the ghost of Jeff. He fires at the vision of Jeff and he lost his second bullet. Scene four, we finished just now. John sees uh, uh, his uh, uh, fellow prisoners. He thinks that he is in prison and he sees the prison guard, the white American, he is very, very angry. He, he thinks he has a shovel with him and he lifts his shovel to break the skull of uh, the prison guard. Suddenly he realizes the fact that he has no shovel with him and he uses his revolver. He fires point blank on the head of uh, the prison guard and uh, he lost his third bullet. Now uh, he has two lead bullet and one silver bullet. Now we move on to scene number five and uh, scene one is 3.30 in the evening. Scene two is 7 p.m. Scene three is 9 p.m. Scene four, 11 p.m. And scene five, it is after two hours. And it is, of course, or oh, it is in fact 1 a.m. after midnight. And now we will read and discuss Scene number five of Emperor Johns of Eugene O'Neill. Five. One o'clock, a large circular clearing enclosed by the serried ranks of gigantic trunks of tall trees whose tops are lost to view. In the center is a big dead stump worn by time into a curious resemblance to an ocean block. The moon floods the clearing with a clear light. John forces his way in through the forest on the left. He looks wildly about the clearing with hunted, fearful glances. His pants are in tatters, his shoes cut and misshapen, flapping about his feet. He slings cautiously to the stump in the center and sits down in a tense position, ready for instant flight. Then he holds his head in his hands and rocks back and forth, mourning to himself miserably. So scene five is, of course, very, very 
uh, interesting by uh, it's almost uh, 1 a.m. and uh, uh, it is of course uh, 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 there is some light in the forest because it's uh, uh, a moonlit uh, night and uh, we see very disappointed downhearted worn out uh, uh, John's just mourning to himself he's crying deeply lamenting deeply oh lord lord oh lord lord suddenly he throws himself on his knees and raises his clasped hands to the sky in a voice of agonized pleading lord jesus hear my prayer i as a poor sinner a poor sinner i know i done wrong i know it so john admits his mistake he uh, is asking pardon he is just confessing lord jesus hear my prayer i am a poor sinner i know i did i did uh, uh, wrong you uh, when i catch just jeff cheating with loaded dice my anger overcomes me and i kills him dead so one by one embra johns is confessing all his mistakes he confesses that he killed jeff i kills him dead lord i done wrong when that god hits me with the whip my anger overcomes me and i kills him dead that is the second murder he killed the prison guard he killed jeff first murder then he killed the prison guard second murder lord i done wrong and down here war this fool bush niggers raised me up to the seat of the mighty i steals all i could grab okay and when here in this island this native people made me the emperor i became the emperor and i grabbed all the wealth i could grab from them i am i'm sorry about it lord i done wrong i know it i sorry forgive me lord forgive this poor sinner then beseeching terrifiedly and keep them away lord keep them away from me and stop that drum sounding in my ears oh lord save me from this inhabitants of the island please stop that the beating of the tom tom that begin to sound haunted too he gets to his feet evidently slightly reassured by his prayer with attempted confidence now ever jones thinks that now that he has prayed god is with him that he is going to be saved by god so he uh, is rather reassured right now is more confident right now the lord will preserve me from them haunts after this it, he assures himself that god is going to uh, save him sits down and and the stump again i ain't scared of real men i'm not scared of real men let them come but then others he shadows them looks down at his feet working his toes inside the shoes with a groan oh my poor feet them shoes ain't no use no more uh, setting to hurt i is better off without them now he feels a lot of discomfort inside the boot and he decides to remove the boot he unlaces them and pulls them off holds the rags of the shoes in his hands and regards them mournfully you was real a gone patching leather too look at you emperor you was getting mighty low okay now he takes the boots and he looks at it he is deciding uh, to decide to throw it away he sits dejectedly and remains with bowed shoulders very very disappointed downhearted emperor johns staring down at the shoes in his hands as if reluctant to throw them away while his attention is thus occupied a crowd of figures silently enter the clearing from all sides now there is another apparition all are dressed in southern costumes of the period of the 50s of uh, the last century they are middle aged men who are evidently well to do planters there is one spruce authoritative individual the auctioneer so right now 
we have another vision and uh, we see a lot of planters a lot of planters are on stage so also the auctioneer there is the auctioneer and there is also the planter and we understand that this is of course a typical slave market of the 19th century and uh, now uh, let's continue there is a crowd of curious spectators chiefly young bells and dandies who have come to the slave market for diversion so this is a 19th century slave market and a lot of negroes are uh, there and all these negroes will be purchased by planters white planters so uh, the slave trade uh, is very interesting so planters will be buying the negroes and there is going to be auctioneering and this auctioneer uh, this auction the auctioneer will auction all these slaves and the auction is going to be interesting so there are some spectators some young white uh, young ladies and uh, men have come there so they are just going to enjoy the auction that is to take place so that we have a scene from the 19th century slave market in which slaves are negro slaves are uh, sold so uh, there is something stiff rigid unreal marian tish about their movements they group themselves about the stump finally a batch of slaves are led in from the left by an attendant now there there are planters there are white men and women and a group of slaves are brought in by an attendant three men of different ages two women one with a baby in her arms nursing they are placed to the left of the stump besides john so we have the slave market so some slaves are uh, led in and uh, we have three men uh, negroes uh, so also two women and one of the women is having a baby and uh, uh, beside these three men and two women we have of course uh, john himself so this is a 19th century slave market and uh, we see the anger of john's uh, john's is angry and uh, he doesn't want uh, negroes to be treated like this he doesn't want slavery to continue and now let us see what happened in a slave market the white planters look them over appraisingly as if they were cattle so these negroes are looked upon as if they they are just cattle and exchange judgments on each so the white people they make a lot of comments oh very good that guy that 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 man is that negro is uh, very very uh, good like he is he is having a very good physique is very strong i will buy him for maybe 50 dollars i'll buy him for maybe 100 dollars he is worth 100 okay so they will be making very very ugly comments about the slaves to be sold to be auctioned and now the dandies point with their fingers and make witty remarks so all these young men and women they make a lot of comments the bells titter bewitchingly so they are just uh, uh, laugh laughing loudly all this is this in in silence save for the ominous throb of the tom tom same time we have the sound of the tom tom the auctioneer holds up his hand taking his place at the stump the group strain forward attentively he touches john's on the shoulder peremptorily motioning for him to stand on the stump the auction block so in the center is the stump the stump is the auction block so now the auctioneer he is asking john's to be seated on the stump so john's is going to be uh, sold john's looks up sees the figures on all sides looks wildly for some opening to escape sees none screams and leaps madly to the top of the stump to get as far away from them as possible he stands there cowering paralyzed with horror the auctioneer begins a silent spiel he points to john's appeals to the planters to see for themselves 
is a good feel and sound in wind and limb as they can see. Very strong still in spite of his being middle-aged. Look at that back. Look at those shoulders. Look at the muscles in his arms and his sturdy legs. So the planters just uh, evaluate uh, John's. So he is well-built. He is worth buying. Capable of any amount of hard labor. Moreover, of a good disposition, intelligent and tractable. Will any gentleman start bidding? Now the bidding has to start. So the planters can just uh, say how much they will pay for John's, who is well built. The planters raise their fingers, make their bids. They are apparently all eager to possess John's. The bidding is lively, the crowd interested. While this has been going on, John's has been seized by the courage of desperation dares to look down and around him over his face abject terror gives way to mystification to gradual realization stutteringly and now when the bidding is going on uh john's is so angry what you're doing white fox is very angry and he's protesting what's all this what are you all looking at me for what are you doing with me anyhow suddenly Conversed with raging hatred and fear. Is this an auction? Is you selling me like they must have before the war? Jerking out his revolver just as the auctioneer knocks him down to one of the planters, glaring from him to the purchaser. So when uh, John is about to be sold, he is taking his revolver at and he's pointing at the auctioneer and uh, uh, jerks, jerking out his revolver just as the auctioneer knocks him down to one of the planters. So the auctioneer is uh, uh, just hitting at John's and John's falls down. And uh, uh, as if this were a signal, the walls of the now, of course, uh, uh, as uh, he fires at the auctioneer and at the planter with such rapidity that the two shots are almost simultaneous. And now when the auctioneer is knocking down John's, he fires at the auctioneer and he also fires at the planter and he loses the third and uh, the, no, the fourth and the fifth bullet. Okay. So he, lose, he lost almost five bullets right now. So uh, the first bullet at the formless, uh, little formless spheres, second bullet at uh, Jeff, third bullet at prison guard, and fourth at the auctioneer, and the fifth at the planter. So Johns has lost uh, five of uh, the bullets. Now the silver, silver bullet is uh, the only bullet that is left with uh, uh, Emperor Johns. He fires at the auctioneer and at the planter with such rapidity that the two shots are almost simultaneous, as if this were a signal the walls of the forest folding. Only blackness remains and silence broken by Johns as he rushes off, crying with fear and by the quickened, ever louder beat of the tom tom. Now he has fired a fifth time and uh, uh, the, the firing sound should have been audible to the uh, Negroes, the native people. So the native people come closer and we hear loud beating of the tom-tom and uh, Johns is running away in a haste. And now we move on to the uh, sixth uh, uh, scene. Okay, so far we have finished five scenes. And now we come to the sixth scene. The, the time of uh, the action of scene six is after two hours. So scene uh, five was at uh, 1 a.m. Scene six is uh, at uh, uh, 3 a.m. Okay, so two more hours passed. And now uh, we have another scene. Uh, again, uh, this is expressionistic. So scene number two, three, four, five, six, and seven are expressionistic. They are the collective unconscious of Emperor Jones. 
the very past of Emperor Jones is just uh, boomeranging. So scene six, three o'clock, a cleared space in the forest. The limbs of the trees meet over it, forming a low ceiling about five feet from the ground. The interlocked ropes of creepers reaching upward to entwine the tree tongues give an arched appearance to the sides. The space thus enclosed is like the dark, noisome hold of some ancient vessel. The moonlight is almost completely shut out and only a vague van light filters through. There is the noise of someone approaching from the left, stumbling and crawling through the undergrowth. John's voice is heard between chattering moans. Now, John's is just moaning and uh, let us uh, uh, listen to the morning sound of Emperor John's. Oh Lord, what I going do now? Ain't got no bullet left one, the silver one. If more of them have horns come up to me, how I grin scare them away. So he laments, he asks God, God, what shall I do? I only have the silver bullet now. If more Negroes come, if not of these native people come, how can I scare them away? Lord, only the silver one left, and I gotta save that for luck. If I shoot that one, I am gone or sure. So I have just the silver bullet. And if I fire, the, uh, fire that silver bullet, my luck is lost. Silver bullet is my luck. Silver bullet is my rabbit's paw. So if I lose that, I am no more fortunate. I'm no more lucky. Lord, is the black here? Is the black here? War is the moon. Uh, now he cannot see anything. She asks, Oh Lord, don't this night ever come to an end? By the sounds, he is feeling his way cautiously forward. There, this feels like a clear space. I gotta lie down and rest. I don't care if them niggers that coach me, I gotta rest. So he is very tired. Emra Jones is very tired and he talks to himself. Uh, he, uh, he mustn't run anymore. You now he is very tired. Uh, understand the time is 3 a.m. So it's almost 12 hours since he began this running. 3 uh, 30 p.m. Uh, he started running. He left his palace. Now it's almost 3 a.m. 12 hours passed. He was running far and wide. So he talks to himself to rest for some time. Okay. And now he is well forward now where his figure can be dimly made out. His pants have been so torn away that what is left of them is no better than a breech cloth. So he's so full of uh, uh, scratches. His dress is, his, even his pants uh, is torn away. He flings himself full length face downward on the ground. So he's lying face down, full stretched on the ground panting with exhaustion. Gradually, it seems to grow lighter in the enclosed space and two rows of seated figures can be seen behind John's. So this is something like, uh, uh, we have something like, of course, uh, yeah, more uh, Negroes, another apparition. Gradually, it seems to grow lighter in the enclosed space and two rows, two rows of seated figures can be seen behind John's. They are sitting in crumpled, despairing attitude, hunched, facing one another with their back towards the forest walls as if they were shackled to them. All are Negroes, naked, save for loincloths. So now, in fact, this is a scene from a slave ship. So this is a ship and Emperor Johns is there. Behind Emperor Johns is a number of Negroes. They are all slaves. And uh, this is in fact a slave ship. And uh, John C. is working along with the slaves in this slave ship. So they are sitting in crumpled, despairing attitudes, hunched, facing one another with their backs, touching the forest walls as if they were shackled to them. 
All are Negroes, naked save for loin clothes. At first they are silent and motionless. Then they begin to sway slowly forward toward each other and back again in unison, as if they were laxly letting themselves follow the long roll of a ship at sea. At the same time, a low melancholy murmur rises among them, increasing gradually by rhythmic degrees, which seem to be directed and controlled by the throb of Tom Tom in the distance to a long tremulous wail of despair that reaches a certain pitch, unbearably acute, then falls by slow gradations of tone into silence and is taken up again. John starts, looks up, sees the figures and throws himself down again to shout, shut out the sight. Okay, so this is the scene from the slave ship. A shudder of terror shakes his whole body and the veil races up about him again. But the next time his voice, as if under some uncanny compulsion, starts with the others. As their chorus lifts the rise, lifts, he rises to a sitting posture similar to the others, swaying back and forth. His voice reaches the highest pitch of sorrow, desolation. The light fades out. The other voices cease and only darkness is left. John's can be heard scrambling to his feet and running off, his voice sinking down the scale and receding as he moves farther and farther away in the forest. The tom-tom beats louder, quicker, with a more insistent triumphant pulsation. So, seen from the slave ship, John uh, is sitting along with other slaves in the slave ship and uh, uh, he listens to the tom-tom sound and uh, the, the past is haunting him, the present is also haunting him. So the past is the past of Emperor Jones as a slave. The present is Emperor Jones being hunted by the inhabitants of the island, the natives of the island. And now as the tom-tom sound is increasing, as it is becoming louder and closer, John's is running farther away into the forest. That is scene number uh, six. And now we move on to the seventh scene. Seventh scene is again after two hours. So it's almost 5 a.m. in the morning. It's early dawn. So uh, now we have uh, uh, the last but scene of the play, Emperor John's of Eugene O'Neill. Let us commence the discussion of scene seven. Five o'clock, the foot of a gigantic tree by the edge of a great river, a rough structure of boulders like an altar. So this is in fact uh, a, uh, a, a scene from, uh, in fact, Central Africa. So this is, uh, John's is in Congo. Congo, as we know, is in Central Africa. And uh, uh, John's uh, sees a sacrificial altar in Central Africa. And he, uh, of course, sees the crocodile god. So this is in fact necromancy and black magic used by uh, maybe some people in Africa. And uh, that is uh, very interesting. Let us see what uh, Johns does when he faces the crocodile god. A rough structure of boulders like an altar is by the tree. The raised river bank is in the near background. Beyond this, the surface of the river spreads out, brilliant and unruffled in the moonlight, blotted out and merged into a veil of bluish mist in the distance. John's voice is heard from the left rising and falling in the long, despairing wail of the chained slaves to the rhythmic beat of the tom-tom. So all the time we have the sound of uh, the drum beat, the tom-tom sound is there. As his voice sinks into silence, he enters the open space. The expression of his face is fixed and stony. His eyes have an obsessed glare. He moves with a strange deliberation, 
like a sleepwalker or one in a trance. He looks around at the tree, the rough stone altar, the moonlit surface of the river beyond, and passes his hand over his head with a vague gesture of puzzled bewilderment. Then as if in obedience to some obscure impulse, he sinks into a kneeling devotional posture before the altar. So there we have the sacrificial altar and in front of the sacrificial altar, Emperor Jones is sitting in a kneeling devotional posture. Then he seems to come to himself partly to have an uncertain realization of what he is doing, for he straightens up and stares about him horrifiedly in an incoherent mumble. Now he is very, very afraid and he speaks something in an incoherent way. What? What is I doing? What is this place? Seems like, seems like I know that tree and them stones and the river. I remember, seems like I've been here before, tremblingly. Oh, gory. Oh, sorry. I scared in this place. I scared. I'm afraid of this place. Oh, Lord, protect this sinner. Oh, I'm afraid. Oh, God, please protect me. Protect this sinner. Crawling away from the altar, he cowers close to the ground. John is very afraid. His face hidden, his shoulders heaving with sobs of historical fright. From behind the trunk of the tree, as if he had sprung out of it, the figure of the Congo witch doctor appears. He is wizened and old, naked except for the fur of sm some small animal tied about his waist, its bushy tail hanging down in front. His body is stained all over a bright red. So we have the Congo witch doctor, black magic. Uh, practitioner of black magic necromancy. Antelope horns are on each side of his head, branching upward. So the very appearance of the Congo witch doctor, a lot of, uh, 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 it is in fact, uh, he has uh, tied some small animals around his waist and antelope horns are just uh, hung uh, uh, on, on his uh, head, uh, and the horns are on each side of his head. And now, in one hand, he carries a bone rattle, in the other, a charm stick with a, bra with, with a bunch of white cockatoo feathers tied to the end, a great number of glass beads and bone ornaments are about his neck, ears, wrists, and ankles. So the very appearance of an indigenous uh, practitioner of black magic and necromancy here, he struts noiselessly with a cure prancing step to a position in the clear ground between John's and the altar. Then with a preliminary summoning stamp of his foot on the earth, he begins to dance and to chant. As if in response to his summons, the bearing of the tom tom grows to a fierce, exultant boom, whose throbs seem to fill the air with vibrating rhythm. Now, the uh, Congo witch doctor is chanting some prayers along with the chanting of the prayers of the witch doctor. In the background, we hear the sound of the tom tom. John looks up, starts to spring to his feet reaches a half kneeling, half squatting position and remains rigidly fixed there, paralyzed with old fascination by this new apparition. The witch doctor sways, stamping with his foot, his bones rattle clicking the time. His voice rises and falls in a weird, monotonous croon without articulate word divisions. Gradually, his dance become clearly one of narrative in pantomime. His croon is 
an incantation, a charm to allay the fierceness of some implacable deity demanding sacrifice. So now the Konko witch doctor is chanting some prayers. The witch doctor is asking, is invoking the gods to intervene. And uh, now uh, the whole uh, Johns has become completely hypnotized. His voice joins in the incantation in the cries, he beats time with his hands and sways his body to and fro with a waist. The whole spirit and meaning of the dance has entered into him, has become his spirit. Finally, the theme of the pantomime holds on a howl of despair and is taken up again in a knot of savage hope. There is a salvation. The forces of evil demand sacrifice. There must be a peace. The witch doctor points with his van to the sacred tree, to the river beyond, to the altar, and finally to John's with a ferocious command. John seems to sense the meaning of this. It is he who must offer himself for sacrifice. He beats his forehead abjectly to the ground, mourning historically. Now the witch doctor is asking John's to be the uh, the offering uh, to, to be the uh, sacrifice and he is mourning hysterically mercy oh god lord mercy mercy on this poor sinner the witch doctor springs to the river bank he stretches out his arms and calls to some good within uh, some good within its depths then he starts backward slowly his arms remaining out a huge head of a crocodile appears over the bank and its eyes glittering greenly fa fasten upon John's. He stares into them fascinatedly. The witch doctor prances up to him, touches him with his van, motions with hideous command toward the waiting monster. John squirms on his belly nearer and nearer, mourning continually mercy lord mercy now the witch doctor is inviting the crocodile god and asking john's to be the uh, uh, offering and john's is just mourning the crocodile heaves more of his enormous hulk onto the land john squirms toward him the witch doctor's voice shrill out in furious exultation the tom tom beats madly. John cries out in a fierce, exhausted spasm of anguish, pleading. Now John is crying, and the crocodile is advancing towards Emperor uh, John's. Lord, save me! Lord Jesus, hear my prayer. Immediately, in answer to his prayer, comes the thought of the one bullet left him. So at this moment. He remembers he has the silver bullet, bullet with him. He snatches at his hip, shouting defiantly, the silver bullet, you don't get me yet. He fires at the green eyes in front of him. The head of the crocodile sinks back behind the river bank. The witch doctor springs behind the sacred tree and disappears. John lies with his face to the ground, his arms outstretched, whimpering with fear at the throb of the tom-tom, fills the silence about him with a somber pulsation, a baffled but revengeful power. And now Emperor Jones has fired at uh, the crocodile and uh, the uh, images of the visions of the crocodile god and the witch doctor vanishes and Emperor Johns has just lost the sixth bullet. The silver bullet is lost. And now uh, we have the last scene, scene eight, the realistic scene. Okay. Uh, the first scene and the last scenes are the realistic scenes. And now let us come to the last scene, the ending of the play. It's dawn, early dawn. That is almost. Uh, uh, one hour or one and a half hours after uh, 6 or 6.30 a.m. 
dawn same as scene two the dividing line of forest and plain it is the edge of the forest same scene the nearest uh, from this we understand that emra jones did not move at all he was still at the brink or border or edge of the forest the nearest tree trunks are dimly revealed but the forest behind them is still a mass of blooming shadows the tom tom seems on the very spot so loud and continuously vibrating are its beats lem enters from the left followed by a small squad of his soldiers so the na native chieftain lem comes forward he has the natives his soldiers behind him and by the cockney trader smithers so smithers the trader is also along with the native chief lem lem is a heavy set ape faced old savage of the extreme african type dressed only in a loin cloth so these are native people so they are uh, just uh, indigenous tribal people and they have just uh, very little dress that is a loin cloth a revolver and cartridge belt are about his waist his soldiers are in different degrees of rag conceal nakedness all wear broad palm leaf hats each one carries a rifle smithers is the same as in scene one one of the soldiers evidently a tracker is peering about keenly on the ground he grunts and points to the spot where john's entered the forest lem and smithers come to look now the native uh, people they have located they have spotted emra john's and john's is lying face down flat outstretched on the ground and the negroes they just gather around the body of emra john's and lem and smithers come closer to have a look at the body of brutus john's emra john's smithers after a glance turns away in disgust that's where he went in right enough much good it will do here his smiles are by the sand safe to the coast damn his side i told you you'd lose him didn't i wasting the whole blooming night beating your bloody drum and casting your silly spells god blind me what a pack so smithers right now tells that okay so uh emperor johns he just uh, he was trying to uh, run away he was trying to go to the coast he was about to board the uh, ship the boat and uh, now okay didn't i tell you that he was trying to escape now uh, okay you you are all foolish your prayers your tom tom everything is foolish he was about to escape lem gutturally we caught him you see okay yeah now the chief speaks to smithers we have caught him we catch him he makes a motion to his soldiers who squat down on their hutches in a semicircle so all the soldiers of lem sits around the body of johns in semicircle smithers exasperatedly angrily well ain't you going in and and in, in the woods what the hell's the good of waiting were indeed about to look for him in the forest and uh, what the hell is the good of waiting lem imperturbably very undisturbed squatting down himself we caught him at last we have caught emra jones we caught him smithers turning away from his from his contemptuously oh gone gone uh, means nonsense he is better better man than the lot of you put together i hate the sight of him but i'll stay say that for him anyway i i say he is very very clever i hate him still i agree he was very clever a sound of snapping twigs comes from the forest the soldiers jump to their feet cocking their rifles alertly lem remains sitting with an imperturbable expression while listening intently the sound from the woods is repeated lem makes a quick signal with his hand his followers creep quickly but noiselessly into the forest scattering so that each enters at a different spot smithers in the silence 
that follows in a contemptuous whisper. You ain't thinking that would be him, I hope. Lem calmly, we coach him. Lem, the chieftain, is sure that they are going to, his soldiers are going to catch him. Smithers blaster, fatters. Then after a second thought, wonderingly, still and all, it might happen. If he lost his bloody way in these stinking woods, he would likely turn in a circle without his knowing it. They all does. Okay, so Smithers says that maybe uh, if he lost his way in the forest, he will turn in circle without uh, knowing. And uh, Lem peremptorily, peremptorily, that is authoritatively with uh, his power, don't make any noise. The reports of several rifle sound from the forest followed a second later by savage exultant yells. The beating of the tom-tom abruptly ceases. Now the beating of the tom-tom comes to an end. Lem looks up at the white man with a grin of satisfaction, which we coach him, him dead. Now the tom-tom ends and it's a signal. Now that the tom-tom comes to an end, Lem the chieftain is sure that his soldiers have captured Emperor Johns and uh, Lem uh, tells Smithers that uh, we coach him. They have caught Emperor Johns. We coach him. Him dead. Smithers with a snarl. Oh, there, no, it's him. And oh, there, he's dead. Oh, how do you know it's he? How do you know he's dead? How do you know that uh, it is Emperor Johns? How do you know that uh, he's dead? Lem, my men, they got him silver bullets. They kill him, sure. Okay? Yeah, I'm sure because they have got silver bullets and with silver bullet, he could be killed. Lem, lead bullet, no kill him. He got him strong charm. I cook him money, make some silver bullet, make him strong charm too. Okay? Yeah. Uh, he cannot be, Johns cannot be killed with silver bullets. Hence, I made a lot of money and with the money I have uh, made silver bullets and my men have captured him with silver bullets. Smithers light breaking upon him. So that's what you was up all night. What? You were scared to put after him until you would mold the silver bullets. Huh? Oh, you were all waiting to have the silver bullets? Wasn't that the reason why you didn't revolt against him, protest against him, fight against him before? Now that you have the silver bullets, you started the war and you have captured him. You have caught him. Lem simply stating a fact. Yes, him got strong charm. Let no good. Yeah, Embra Jones has some divine power. He has some strong charm and uh, no lead bullet will help us capture him. Now we caught him with a silver bullet. Smither slapping his thigh and guffawing, guffawing, guffawing is laugh, laughing. <laughs> if you don't beat all hell, then record himself scornfully. I'll beat you, retain him, they shot at all, you bleeding loony. Okay, so I'm sure, I bet your foolish soldiers haven't caught him. It is not John's who, who is caught, somebody else. Lem calmly. They come bringing now. Wait, wait. They, my soldiers will be coming now. They will bring his dead body. The soldiers come out of the forest carrying John's limb body. Now John's is dead. Uh, the soldiers of Lem bring the dead body of Emperor John's. There is a little reddish purple hole under his left breast. He is dead. They carry him to Lem who examines his body with great satisfaction. Smithers leans over his shoulder in a tone of frightened Oh, Well, they did for your right enough. John C. Me lad, dead as a erring, mockingly. Where is your high and mighty ears now, you blooming majesty? Then with a grin, silver bullets, <laughs> blimey. What you dead in the 18th of style? Anyhow, Lem makes a motion to the soldiers to carry the body out left 
Smithers speaks to him sneeringly. Okay, now uh, Lem speaks. Oh, you, you John C, you Emperor Johns, we have killed you, and uh, your uh, uh, we we are no more under your uh, rule. Your silver bullets, your silver bullets, by God. Okay, you di you died in in high style, in in the style of of course. Uh, uh, emperor, our my soldiers killed you with silver bullets. Okay, and uh, now Smithers, the last dialogue of the play. And I suppose you think it's better bleeding charms and your silly beating the drum that made him run in a circle when uh, he had lost himself, don't you? But Lem makes no reply, but does not seem to hear the question. Walks out, left after his men. Smithers looks after him with contemptuous scorn, stupid as hawks, a lot of them, blasted niggers. So at last, uh, Smithers says that uh, uh, the uh, native people, uh, that is uh, Lem and his followers, think that they could kill Johns just because uh, they had uh, the silver bullets and just because they had the charm and uh, uh, Smithers is still uh, contemptuous of uh, the superstitious inhabitants and he calls the Negro people damn niggers, natives. Okay, so with that, uh, we come to the end of the play. The Emperor Johns, at last, uh, Emperor Johns is killed by the uh, natives of uh, the island and uh, uh, we just uh, uh, finish the play here. Okay, so uh, now we have to just uh, consolidate everything. We read out the entire play, all the eight scenes, scene one and scene eight are realistic, middle scenes two, three, four, five, six, and seven are expressionistic. And uh, whatever we see in the middle scenes are of course the uh, in the representation of or rather the incarnation of uh, the collective unconscious of uh, the hero that is of course Brutus Jones or Emperor Jones and now that uh, now that we have finished the play we have to go for uh, uh, the discussion on uh, the, uh, um, uh, the the play the Emperor Jones of uh, uh, Eugene uh, O'Neill so as we all know uh, this uh, play is uh, noted for the blending of realism and uh, expressionism and now we have to discuss uh, some of the important topics so I told uh, uh, the other day the most important topics for discussion so one of the topics is consider uh, the blending of expressionism and realism in the play the Amber Jones we'll be discussing that in another lecture another uh, topic is collective unconscious another one is use of interior monologue in the emperor johns symbolism in the emperor johns expressionism in the emperor johns uh, then importance of the tom tom and of course character sketch of brutus johns and character sketch of uh, henry smithers these are the topic for uh, discussion we'll be discussing all this the uh, in in the next uh, 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 lecture okay so tomorrow uh, same time uh, by 9 9 15 will will i'll be just uh, coming uh, live i'll have a live streaming session in that live streaming session i'll be discussing the topic i said right now so thank you all for uh, joining thank you very much for uh, listening uh, to me take care everybody read the play uh, they just uh, try to uh, uh, get answers to or other think about all the topics I suggest right now come prepared for uh, better uh, and effective uh, useful discussion next day. May God bless you all. Good night. <laughs>